Good evening. I'd like to call to order the special hearing, uh, the special meeting for the public hearing on the 2025 budget. So um, to begin, we're going to just have a review of the 2025 budget from Gary Lutler. I'd like to welcome members of the community to the meeting tonight. The public hearing for the 2025 budget is the library's opportunity to share information about its financial plans for the next calendar year. This hearing is also required by law and must be held at least 10 days before the Library Board of Trustees adopts the budget. The adoption of the 2025 budget will take place at the October 16 board meeting. In August, <clears throat> we received the county's total assessed value figure for calculating the 2025 library property tax rate. The total assessed value for 2025 is about $11.2 billion. That's an increase of about $1.15 billion from last year. That's an 11.46% increase. The assessed value figure not only includes residential property, it also includes commercial property and business inventory and equipment. Library revenue from the property tax levy will increase by 4% in 2025, which is the growth quotient. So with an 11.46% increase in the value of the taxable property and a 4%, a smaller 4% increase in the amount of tax revenue to be collected, the library tax rate will fall from the current 8.53 cents per $100 of assessed value. It'll fall to 7.93 cents uh, in 2025. So this slide shows the trend in assessed value and the library tax rate over the past several years. It shows a declining trend in the library tax rate as assessed value has increased at a faster pace than revenue increases based on the growth quotient. This slide <clears throat> is a summary of the 2025 budget <clears throat> compared to last year's budget. If it's hard to see, it's also on page four in your packet. Uh, the first section, the revenue section for the operating fund, um, the total projected revenue for the operating fund in 2025 is about $11.4 million. The property tax levy, which makes up most of the operating fund revenue, will be slightly under $8 million, an increase of about $306,000 from the previous year. Local income tax revenue is estimated to be about $3,050,000, which is an increase from last year of about $160,000. In total, this report shows an estimate for an increase in operating in operating revenue for 2025 of about $350,000. And uh, moving to the operating fund spending section, the total <coughs> operating cost for 2025 is budgeted at about $12.1 million. <coughs> the increase from the 2024 operating budget is about $697,000. For 2020, the 2025 budget, um, we're using an estimated wage increase of 2.8% or 80 cents an hour, whichever is greater. When we get to year end and we know what healthcare related costs will be for 2025, then we will make a final decision on wage adjustments for 2025. Before moving to the next slide, are there any questions 
uh, about this year's budget. So this slide is uh, the operating surplus analysis. And uh, I prepared this report to show the trends in the major categories of operating revenue and cost over the past several years. The data on this report is based on actual spending and revenues starting in 2020. This report is on page five in the packet. So let's look at the bottom line because it shows the actual operating surplus trend for past years and what is expected for the current year and next year. So looking back at 2021, the library had an operating surplus of about $1.8 million, which was allocated to the branch project. Then in 2022, the surplus was a little over a million dollars. We allocated 240,000 to the branch project and carried over about 800,000 in the rainy day fund. For 2023, the surplus dropped to about $438,000. I think this year's surplus will be in the 500 to $800,000 range. After this year, when we know what the final results are for 2024, we can begin to consider options for possible service expansion in the future to meet the growing needs for library service in this community. Are there any questions? Why? What is your reasoning for thinking that it's gonna, we're gonna have more this year than we had last? Oh. You said 5,000 oh. instead of the four, oh, so. the reason why I think it's gonna be higher this mm -hmm. year? Um, the big reason is that in May, um, we got a, a supplemental local income tax distribution. We get that every year in May but it varies in size. Okay. And this year it was relatively large. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why I, I think uh, the surplus is gonna be larger this year. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Well, I think uh, I don't have any more for this part of it, so we can probably move on to the regular board meeting. Um, any comments on any, any slides on that? Any questions for Gary? Okay. Any comments from the public? Okay. Seeing none, all in favor of adjourning this meeting signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. And we are adjourned. Now we'll move on, and I would like to call to order the September meeting of the Monroe County Public Library Board of Trustees. To begin, we'll just go around and introduce ourselves, and if we care to, share something that we're reading or listening to or playing. Kathy, we'll start with you. I'm reading Sanctuary of the Shadow. Um, it's a science fiction kind of novel, venturing, broadening my horizons. <laughs> My name is Chris Hall, and I finished um, The Unmaking of June Farrow by Adrian Young, and I'm rereading um, Devil in the White City because I'm having book club, and I need to remember it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm Greer Carson. I'm reading In Search of a Concrete Music by Pierre Schaefer and rereading Dilla Time and playing Little Nightmares 2 on the PS5 with my family. I'm Chris Harrison, and I am listening to The First State of Being by Aaron and Trotta Kelly, and I'm reading All the Answers by Kate Messner. Michelle Wash, and currently reading The Four Pivots. Actually, I'm listening to on audiobook The Four Pivots by Dr. Sean Ginwright. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Amy O'Shaughnessy. I'm very sorry I'm late. Um, what am I? listening to. I'm not sure what I'm reading right now. I'm going <laughs> to continue on. I've been there before. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you very much. Yep. All right. 
So the first item on our agenda is to approve the consent agenda items, including the minutes from the August 21st board meeting, the monthly financial report, monthly bills for payment, the personnel report, and the board meeting calendar. Do we have a motion to approve these items? So moved. So moved. Okay, second. Okay. And any questions or comments regarding the consent agenda items? I have one quick comment on page 43 of the finance report or the packet itself rather it looks a little different than usual we had some errors in downloading our monthly chase report and so what you see is a scanned and printed copy or printed and scanned copy with some chicken scratch on it so just wanted to call that out okay. seeing no questions all those in favor of approving the consent agenda items signify by saying aye aye, aye. opposed nay the ayes have it. Next, we'll move on to the director's monthly report from Greer. All right. Uh, in August, we launched Hoopla Flex, which is a new way of borrowing materials from our very popular platform, Hoopla. It allows for patrons to make suggestions for purchase, very much like they do with physical collections. Also helps us manage the increasing cost of this platform, like so many other platforms. We want to evenly distribute access to Hoopla across our entire patron base. Uh, yeah, patron base. So within the first few weeks of having launched uh, Hoopla Flex, we were happy to see we have over 100 individual requests for digital titles, so that's good. Our Southwest Teaching Kitchen reopened to the public last month, and our friends at MCCSC reserved the kitchen on a weekly basis. I'm sure Kathy Riley will share a little more tonight on the Teaching Kitchen and Community Partnerships as part of her presentation, but we are so glad to have this unique facility back open to the public. Indiana Legal Services, with whom we partner on our legal service kiosk at the downtown library, provided an eviction sealing clinic where patrons were able to meet with an attorney to file the paperwork needed to apply for eligible evictions uh, to be sealed, and this is based on the 2022 update to the Indiana Code. Our Ellettsville Branch Garden saw another successful growing season. This year we yielded over 70 pounds of produce, which we donated to Pantry 279, as we do, and offered several gardening education programs, including Make Your Own Salsa program and a Growing Gardeners program series for younger kids. Our outreach staff hosted a wheelchair challenge at the Bloomington Council for Community Accessibility's annual ADA celebration held at City Hall Farmers Market, where participants of all ages maneuvered a, ma a manual wheelchair up and down slopes and around obstacles to get a sense for how challenging basic mobility can be for many in our community. We have added uh, kiosks for clocking in for staff as part of our new HRIS platform, Paylocity. They're now at Ellettsville and Southwest as well as downtown to help time card clock-ins be much easier for staff. <clears throat> and we have a draft remote and hybrid work policy. We've been working on this for a couple of years now. Uh, we're going to be sharing it with our leadership team tomorrow in our meeting and then soon with all library staff. And then we expect to bring this policy to you all re for review by the end of this year. We also uh, held our annual Friends at the Library meeting here at the down, or here, at, sorry, at Southwest uh, a couple of weeks ago. We had to reschedule that from earlier in the summer. It was a good turnout and a very good meeting. So I don't know how many of us, if any of us were able to attend the staff meeting you had yesterday. Is there a highlight or a particular program that was Well, so well we had, uh, yeah, I was going to leave it for next month to be technically consistent, but I'm happy to yeah. talk <laughs> about staff day. We did hold our annual um, staff day yesterday. Um, we do this every year. It's a chance for staff to get together and see one another. Uh, many people don't see each other on a daily basis because we have 173 employees across three locations. <coughs> um, it's a learning day but it's also a community building day for us. Uh, we usually have one big keynote presentation and then a whole series of smaller workshops, um, and that's what we did, and we invited Reverend Forrest Gilmore from Beacon to come and give a presentation on how to engage people in crisis, and that was fantastic. Um, we work very, very hard to balance that sort of learning with kind of mingling and getting to know your fellow colleagues, and that's kind of what the day was all about. And it was a really good turnout as far as staff day goes, and we had a lot of fun. So Great. another successful one, yeah. Any other questions or comments for Greer? Um, for the chaos, chaosity, or whatever 
Is it, only, yeah. is it only kiosk or do they get to use their phone? Oh, they have, we have an app you can use on your phone, yeah. you can okay. log into your computer, there are multiple ways to yeah. do it. Okay. The reason we did the kiosks um, is because for a lot of our folks, particularly the folks who, who work hourly and maybe 15 hours a week or 25 hours a week, they're coming in, they're clocking in, they're getting right to work. And so expecting them to line up to use a shared computer just doesn't make okay. a whole lot of sense. Yeah. And Paylocity uh, works very well on an iPad app, and right, that's it was one I, of the reasons yeah. we were excited about it. So it was literally just buying a handful of iPads, mounting them okay. near the staff entrances, and very it's good. just a third way people can clock into the things. So. Okay. Next, we will move on to old. Um, <coughs> excuse me, old business. And from that one, we're just going to hear from Christine Sneed on the Polaris Vega Discover demonstration. We're going to see a demonstration of that platform and some of the, and hear about the launch plans. I'm sorry, I didn't realize, I, I didn't read my whole lines. I don't have my computer, my reading glasses on. Mm -hmm. So we'll also hear um, from Vanessa Schwegman, uh, did I say that right? And Paula Gray Overton. <laughs> oh, hi. Well, we're so excited to share uh, Vega Discover with you all, but first we would like to introduce ourselves. I'm Paula Gray Overtum. I work in the IT department as the web administrator. I'm Vanessa Schweigman. I also work in the IT department as the library system manager. And I'm Christine Sneed. I'm the ILS coordinator in the organizational development department. Um, and together, we make up the Vega Discover implementation team. Um, we're really good at creating long names because all of our names are long. Um, <laughs> and we're so excited to show you a little sneak peek of what uh, is going to soon to be MCPL's new um, public catalog. But first, we want to give you a little uh, view of what our current catalog looks like. So you're probably familiar with it. Um, we can log into our account, which I'm going to log into our quick one. <laughs> it's a super real patron. <laughs> so we have here a uh, flippity cat kitty cat fluffers, um, who's going to be turning 25 this year. So he's been a staple at MCPL for quite some time. But uh, so we can log into our account. Uh, we can check out and see what sort of things we have ch currently checked out. So our physical materials that we've checked out from the library is very on brand. Uh, we can look at our holds for physical materials at the library as well. We can look at our checkout history if we have that enabled. Uh, we can look at our saved searches, if you have any saved. Um, and you can also look at some of your saved title list searches. So these are all things that we can currently do in our catalog. Um, we can also, of course, perform searches. Uh, so if we search here, we can see the different types of formats in our search. Uh, so this is the large print version, we have the regular print version, the audiobook on CD, and our playaway versions. Here we can place holds, we can look at more information by clicking on one of them, we can quickly see the summary, see different subjects, get the call number, and then see a little bit more kind of suggestions and some other stuff. So we got some series information, some similar titles, some similar authors, all that sort of fun stuff. Um, and our catalog has been with us for quite some time. It gets updated pretty regularly, but it's still missing some pretty key features, uh, namely being e-content, I would say, that's not in our catalog. Um, so, so to introduce you to 
Vega discover, first we have to kind of mention Vega LX. So that's kind of the overall arching um, piece that new innovative has created. It helps us create this new ecosystem that's gonna connect our Polaris ILS that we currently have with all these great functions that we could uh, purchase that were only previously through other vendors. And so now it's this connected ecosystem that is fully secure because it's within the same system. Um, and so the one that we were talking about today is Vega Discover. It uh, is our, um, sorry, I'm trying to think of what the best way is to describe it. <laughs> so it is our um, new catalog. So it's gonna be an overlay system to um, make it all connected. So, the, oops, sorry, wrong one. The three main key features of Vega Discover that we found to be just superb are the roll-ups, the e-content integration, and the synthetics integration. So now let's take that sneak peek at the new catalog and take a look at it. So it looks somewhat similar to the way it currently looks. We can still log into our account We can access our account. We can see this cool little pop-up bookshelf that's gonna stay always available to you as you'll see when we flip through, but we can look through our personal information. I would like to point out, you can see your full barcode number now, which is a pretty big deal to a lot of patrons. Uh, you can also see your current checkouts, but you can also see your current checkouts from physical materials and the e-content. So Overdrive slash Libby and Hoopla are integrated into our catalog. So you can see your checkouts, you can return it, you can see when it's due. You can also see your holds for physical materials and any e-content that you have on hold. You can also check out your bookmarks, which are all gonna roll over when we go live. So if you have those sort of saved things already in the catalog, it's gonna roll over for you. It's very, uh, very pointed cat. Uh, you can also see your saved searches if you have that and your reading history, just like before. And so then you can kind of slip it back down and you can still perform your searches, but you can quickly get to your account as you would like. So when we do a search, it is going to look a little bit different. We still can do all the refining the searches just like we've always been able to do with a little bit of extra stuff because now you can format, you can do the e-content format. So you can do by e-books, e-audio, and, and then you'll see in the search results that there's one result. So this is our roll up. It's rolling up all the formats into one spot, no more scrolling, trying to find the perfect one that you want. Um, you can quickly see what the call number is for that item. You can see where it's available, so you can quickly see it is available at downtown and Ellisville Library, the Ellisville branch. You can open up and see a little bit more information about that as well. As you click through, uh, the e-content, if it's available, you can get it right then and there. If it's not available yet, you can place a hold on it. Sometimes the vendors will make a little extra login, but that's just because they have a specialty login, but it'll pop up and you can log in. You can also click onto the result and load up that same sort of more information, get all that great summary, um, the, and then all the roll-ups still quite available to you and then you're going to see now the synthetics integration. So it is, again, showing you all those series really quickly in a very easy to view way. Top picks, similar things that you may also like, similar series, similar authors, and it really just kind of keeps going. There's so much available to patrons to peruse. Um, yeah. As far as the, as the, whatever the publisher has said that the order okay. is, because sometimes they're a little bit, you know. Yeah, they're um, copyright order. Yeah. <laughs> and it will also show you if something is not currently available, if the library does not currently have it, um, and um, it will be grayed out, so it kind of is a good indication. We don't have it, and you should suggest it for purchase. Yes. Very nice. <laughs> I agree. I'm so excited about this, but I would invite you all to brag on yourselves a little bit. Can you kind of tell us like some key wins, success stories that you experienced in the process? Oh yeah. Um, sure. Um, <laughs> I'll start. Yeah. <laughs> um, since um, we purchased uh, the 
premium level of this uh, product. It has the ability to make custom headers and footers and do some other customizations um, through the CSS, through the, the, um, the web. And so I built all those, uh, that custom header and footer that you see on it so that it will integrate well with our website. So you can get to the same, uh, you know, main um, links that you would see on our website. So it looks very familiar to people. And um, it took a little bit to get all of that done, but I'm really excited about how well it turned out. Do we, you should be. Are we <laughs> able to, with our bog, do we, need to switch everything? I mean, do we need to start over on our, um, when this is in place, do we then have to switch over? Is it automatically just gonna be accepting the passwords that I had before it and all that? Yeah, yes. it will automatically accept yeah. the same passwords. Yeah. Login, yeah. Username, <laughs> that okay, yeah. And we'll have it all linked in. So if you come to our homepage of our website, and click on to go to the, or do a search, it'll take you to this catalog Excellent. when we're ready to go. Yeah. Yay. Nice. If I could brag oh. on them just Please. a little bit <laughs> as well. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing that you're able to do that. This fantastic team uh, has done a really good job of communicating with staff what we're gonna be doing with this new public access catalog, when it's gonna be coming out, how we're gonna roll it out, why we're doing it, what the benefits are as they walked through. Also, uh, we all appreciate that they didn't just take for granted we were gonna be adding on a new Polaris product. We're sort of taking a critical look at our legacy ILS every time we look at doing something like this. So the vetting process was, was really thorough and I really appreciate that. We made them work for it. <laughs> <laughs> so. I do love that it feels familiar. Yes. One of mm -hmm. my aches is that when I have learned the website and I can see it in my mind and I can tell someone exactly where to go and click and then they go and try to do that thing and it's not the same anymore and I didn't know the website was changing, right? Yeah. So I love that this feels familiar and it's just our brand. Like you see it and you just think MCPO. So I, I, I'm impressed with it. Great job. I'm excited to try it. <laughs> so our implementation of our next steps. So staff are currently kind of taking their own sneak peek and providing feedback to us um, just to help to ensure that our training and our public rollout is well covered um, because they're the ones who are helping people they know they know what to look for uh, and then training for them is going to take place through september through october um, all public services staff will be trained before we go live uh, and then communications and marketing will be posting about it um, on our social media platforms as well as our website at the time of the launch and then we'll launch it to the public and we're hoping for october <laughs> that is I, everything seems to be, oh, I shouldn't say it, but everything's been going very smoothly so far. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and staff are founding really great little things that we need to make sure that people know about or that we could potentially like change just to make a little bit better. So it's been really great. Yeah. I updated two things this morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're rolling it out. looking at the program, the background, because I noticed what you're using and I was really pleased how it sounds like the training from their side should be really good and it sounds like it's going to be allowed for you for a while I mean it's not just going to be a one and done right no yeah yeah that'll be good yeah. that's excellent oh wrong one I also yeah, appreciate how you all have been careful about the timing of the launch and considering the fact that this is really like the third enterprise system that we're changing <laughs> this year and so you don't want to do those just boom, boom, boom. So there's yeah. been a little bit of space, but also taking a look at our public calendar and our programs and figuring out when's the best time to reveal this to the public so you don't inundate people. And I think that was smart, so yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah, they begged us not to do it during summer reading, so we put it off for a little longer. <laughs> I think we should recommend this crew for some Bloomington award whether it's through the commission on the status of women or emerging leaders or even with the chamber of commerce with women excel or their annual awards i really think that this group needs to be highlighted very publicly for taking this on and having such a beautiful end product so i'm plugging that in here all right sure. thank you <laughs> Well, thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank excited. You. Yes.
Jerry's got a tough act to follow. <laughs> yeah. <With> surplus <laughs> items. Hey, next for a new business, we just need to talk about some items that we need to look at surplusing. So do we have a motion to approve the res resolution to surplus some items? So moved. Second. Okay. And Gary's going to explain what we're looking to surplus. So we have uh, three large work tables and <clears throat> three tables with built-in lamps. I believe this furniture is, was up in the administration area and there's doing some work in that area to to, to kind of change it, and so anyway, have some stuff to get rid of. <clears throat> and then there are four worn chairs from the silent reading room. And the final item is the, this painting, uh, Middleton painting. Um, a patron who has some history with this painting, which used to be in the children's department, ha would like to purchase it. And so uh, we, we want to allow that and sell it through the bookstore. Um, and that's why we need to have it reflected on the resolution as a surplus item. Great. Thanks. Any questions? Do you take these surplus items to other facilities that might use them, or are they just not able to be used? Um, I am not sure what Brian's uh, plan is on or whether they will just be discarded, but I think that that's what we usually do. I mean, usually we're, we have clutter and, and we need to, to get rid of it. Uh, but there's that but like brand or that. Yeah, so rest we take stuff to restore a lot. In this case, some of the furniture we're talking about is pretty seriously worn, okay. so I'm not sure they're going to want it. Yeah. Uh, but that's usually our first stop is to go to restore. Yeah. Have we ever thought about hosting community programs and get people engaged in the refurbishing or the rehabbing of these things that we would surplus as an effort to build skill mm -hmm. to support workforce development? No, I don't think we have. Something to think about. Like I'm, I'm in favor of not having the clutter just around let's purge where necessary but if there are opportunities for us to create strategic partnerships or programs to upskill our community members we could think about that even before it reaches its next destination is that something that some of these other um like goodwill don't they have programs for that some of those don't they teach some of those skills or do you is that not something i they don't do? know I'm it used to be I'm the only okay it used to be that i think some of the items yeah. that you would distribute to them, they would learn how to fix things and whatnot. Whether that's still happening, I don't know. Yeah. Something to explore. There was a Thank program you. that the library did a couple of years ago. I don't know if you all have done it since, mm. but it, this was before I was even on the board. It was like teaching people how to do basic car maintenance stuff, changing yeah. your brakes. You all remember yep. this? Fix yep. it fair kind yes. of thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do we still do that? No, when we last did the fix it fair. Do you recall? I was obsessed with that program. Seems I kept like telling everyone, go to the library like they're going to do this. So I'm not saying you all have to add it immediately, but any of those like hands-on taking the library into the community in different ways, I think continues to set us apart. So if you bring that back, let me know because I want to learn how to change my that, brain. Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't think we, we've done it since COVID. I think we, we yeah. have paused at that time. So, okay. but good suggestion, thank you. Yeah. Okay, goodness. Okay, all those in favor of um, the resolution to surplus items signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Um, next, we're ready for our department update. So first, we're going to hear from Children's Services, and that would be Angelica Candelaria. So welcome, Angelica. Hello everyone, I'm really excited to talk about the children's service update. Um, we're first going to start with summer reading, what everybody comes for, what we're known for, a huge event in the summer. We have tweaked our game board just slightly since we redid it last year, so we didn't want to do 
a whole reboot every year just for staff and also our community's sake. That way they know what to expect. What we did is we simplified it. We really did um, talk to every branch and every took everybody's input in that we wanted to make it a little bit more easy because kids wanted to either do a lot more activity-based items and some wanted to, wanted to do more reading. And so to accommodate that, instead of saying you have to do this much reading, we just told them you'd need to do three out of the four activities. So it's half and half to our activities and to our reading so that way they can really accommodate if their child just wants to read a little bit more, not be as active or vice versa. They like to do the physical things, you know, drawing, um, and then do that reading still where they're forced to engage with literature. Um, we also added a thermometer on the side because we did get feedback from the community saying that they needed something to track visually. The kids liked um, coloring that in and seeing the gauge getting bigger and bigger. Um, so we added that in and also the lines here because our kids love to write down what they read. And they love when they come in for prizes to say, look what I read, look what this read. And it's also a way for us to engage with them to be like, oh, you like Dogman? I like Dogman. What was your favorite part? What was your favorite um, book in that series? Um, another thing that we are keeping and going on with is if you see, I don't think it's on this one, but it's ask an MCPL staff member for recommendation. We had a joke this year and the kids loved it. Anything where they could come and show us things. So we asked them to draw their own constellation because it was space theme this year. Um, to tell us a joke, they would run in. Even the shyest ones wanted to show us their poems, their drawings, and we would then share it with the community and also with the library. So we are keeping those engagements in for next year and thereafter because the kids really did like just showing their work. Did you have a joke that you remember from the summer that the kids told you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think. There was so many good ones and some that I think the kids really heard and didn't understand some connotations and were like, I don't know if I should laugh or not. So, um, but we did have, we did create a document where everyone would put the best jokes and we shared it with everyone. Um, and we also did a social media post with those jokes with the staff saying them. So, um, and also with our summer reading, we do have the bookmarks mm -hmm. that we give as, um, prizes and in March we do an art contest for the kids based on the theme of summer reading. Design those bookmarks, we all vote on them from the library staff and then they get made into official bookmarks that are distributed as prizes. Um, this year we had over a hundred entries and it was spectacular. The talent that we have from these kids, I can't even do it now. So. Um, they were very well received this year. Everyone loved them, and it was an underlying theme of, theme of cats in space. Mm -hmm. So as a cat lover, I really like that. <laughs> <laughs> and to some statistics, um, we had 2,633 signups. And for me, it's the percentages of how many people have finished. Mm -hmm. um, that's really great in this community, because I've worked at Denver Public. I've worked at um, a rural library in Maryland, and these are extraordinarily high um, percentages. Mm -hmm. Especially for finished four modules, that means they completed the whole game, and it was 44%. Mm -hmm. That's very high percentage of completion. So that just goes to our marketing, to our staff, to everybody who helps out, that they really do make this enjoyable. And then down here is this, the two age ranges we have. 54% signed up for tween and 45 completed. Children's 46 signed up, and then we have 42 percentage completion, which again is extremely high for those tweens. It's seven to 12, and that's just high for that age range, especially in school, you kind of see it to tend to kind of veer very low, and for us it's very high, and that just speaks to what kind of game we make that they actually want to participate and then they want to complete it to have, you know, all those prizes and just say that they did complete our game. And also to say, in 2022, we had 1,245 total participation. 2023, we had 1,092. So we are climbing back to those pre-pandemic numbers, which is really good to see that they're coming back and wanting to participate with the library pre-COVID times. 
And then some more programming. I am extraordinarily happy with the team that we have built. If you were here last year, we had to redo our whole department. <laughs> we had to hire five new people. Um, and those five new people are extraordinarily just come into our department, meld together. It feels like we've been together for decades. And it shows in our numbers of programming. So in summer, we did 100 programs in two months. <laughs> we had over almost 3,000 participants in just those two months. And so I just have breakdowns. What I like about my department is we really do strive to have that even divide of children's and tweens, that we're not veering just for the preschoolers or the tweens. There's an even mix for our families to come to the library with. And then if you look in 2024, We've done 321 programs so far, and we have served almost 5,500, um, 5, I'm trying to think if that's correct, 5,500 participants, which I think is extraordinary as a library, as a team of only 10 that are, re are reaching these numbers. My team is very dedicated in just wanting to give things to our community. Um, just like we have Lego masters, taste testers, we did space golf in the summer. Um, we have tween reads, sensory shenanigans, and letters for our elders. So it's a wide range of programming that we do and that we give to our community. And it's a testament that most of our programs that we hold afterwards, our patrons are like, are you gonna do this again? Is this gonna be a regular occurrence? And unfortunately we have to tell them we, we can't do that. Then you would never have new programming. But that just shows how much we put into our programming that our community does want to keep on having these over and over again. And so for outreach, um, we have really strived to try and meet those communities that we weren't before. We are doing a lot with MCCSC schools. We have new librarians, so they've been putting in the work to meet with all the principals, the libraries, and also just the outreach coordinators there going in person, really sending those emails and keeping those contacts together to try and partner with the schools. Tweens this summer, um, our librarian Lindsay decided to do an hour of outreach in our tween area to really find out what they need. So she went in there with carts and just kind of sat there, talked to them. We thought they were just gonna look at her like a deer in the headlights <laughs> and not really wanna speak to her, but they loved her being there. They loved having different options. She did sneak in some questions in there, asking like, so what do you like to do in the summer? What kind of you know, prizes would you like? What kind of programming? So that'll just help us make that programming even stronger going forward in the future. And then community events. We are still trying to really get into the communities. Um, me personally, I've been trying to get into the Hispanic community Spanish speaking, because I'm a Spanish speaker. So we've done um, things like Fiesta de Otoño, Dia Day, and we also try and get into the college area also, because we know a lot of graduate students come with their families, so we want them to know what kind of resources they have at the library. So I tend to, me and my staff like to go to the IU Welcome Days, and I did one with Dana um, Duffy, and usually it's like, why would a children's manager want to go to IU Day? Well, just in case we get those graduate students or even you know, students who have kids that they know what they have. It's nice to kind of have a well-rounded, not just adult you know, librarians, but librarians from all parts of the library to tell them, hey, you have kids? Awesome. And actually at IU Welcome Day, one of the students was like, I don't read. I don't need a library card. I was like, well, let me tell you. <laughs> we have many things that you would not think. And at the end of the day, he was like, I'll sign up for a library card. I was like, yes. <laughs> um, we said with MCCSC, we hosted the STEM bus as part of our um, summer reading bash. That's, they have a huge bus that kind of collapses and then uncollapses, and they have STEM toys, STEM activities, um, STEM instruction. And so they parked right outside of the library and our students, I mean, not our students, our patrons are able to interact with all the technology that we just don't have the space or budget for. So it was a nice collaboration for our home study kids to come and see what they can use at the library and also what's accessible to them through the library. And also our partnerships with Parks and Rec, we are now gonna have a new story walk thanks to our new um, 
Librarian Reagan. It is at RCA Park that is hopefully will be installed very soon and we'll be blasting that out in social media and telling people um, that we have a new one. We partnered with Hoosier National Forest, um, authors Esme Symes Smith, she did Sir Kelly series, and Kim Howard, who wrote Do Mommies Ever Sleep? She came to one of our story times. Um, we did a Farms, Animals, Meet and Greet with Cider Valley Farm and Forest. We had 300 people attend. Oh, so it was a bit crazy, but. <laughs> um, and we also, oop, didn't mean to go that far. And we also did a skateboarding program of Boys and Girls Club. So if they had a certain percentage of attendance and also um, positive, they get kind of demerits or positive days that they had an overwhelming amount of them, they were able to do this skateboarding program where we partnered with a skateboarding um, community partner here in Bloomington and they provided all the materials and those kids were able to build a skateboard and take it home. So does this have, this was all the different, uh, was all the libraries, so it's not just the downtown one? I mean, as far so as all just, your, your just information. just the downtown that, you, that did just that. Just the downtown, mm -hmm. okay. Because I would think this library, knowing that it's now just opened again, but you'd have a lot more tweens, right, with a bachelor right here mm -hmm. and doing activities. Yeah, we, um, it was our library assistant who did that, um, Paul. And so we struggled with whether we should open it as registration or partner with a community partner. And we decided the community partner just because we wanted to give those kids opportunity to actually have that experience who might not have the funds or resources to actually do it. When do y'all sleep? <laughs> <laughs> I never, that's, <laughs> that's how I feel. Sometimes I have to tell my staff we need to cool it a little bit. We usually take May off because the librarians are doing school visits and things like that. And also in August, we take a two week after summer reading because I don't want them to burn out. And they still are like, can I, can I sneak a program in there? And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> no, but yes. <laughs> so, and we do get questions too during those breaks, like when, it, when is story time coming back? And they're like, yeah. and when we explain it, they, they understand fully. They're like, oh, you know, I couldn't imagine doing that much. So I really do try and, <laughs> Sorry, I never remember. That. <laughs> we really do try and, you know, ease them like you don't have to um, do a full amount because you are going to burn yourself out. I try and remind my librarians that, but they are just so much love this community that they just want to do a full amount. So I haven't found anybody sleeping at their desk yet. Okay, <laughs> and that's really why I was asking because to produce a hundred programs in two months, which totals roughly about a third of your programming that you've done for the year so far, and to have nearly touched your pre-COVID numbers, a lot of organizations are struggling. They're not able to do that. So to see you all doing that, I'm like, I know it's a, an incredible lift, but I wanna make sure you all are well in the process, so. And I do have to say we have um, an awesome volunteering system, thanks to Lorraine. Um, that we do do utilize good. that a lot so i do tell my librarians you know it's better to have more help than less help good so for these big ones like the animal um, meet and greet and just the space golf we really do reach out for volunteers and we get a lot of iu students which is actually really cool because they come to these programs and they're like you you're doing space golf in the children's area you know you're doing these programs i never had as a child and then that makes them even more excited to come and volunteer we get new volunteers because of that. So we do lean very much on our volunteers here at the library. And if someone wanted to partner with you all, let's say like Girl Scouts, if they wanted to partner with the public library, how does someone reach out for a partnership or a program? That can go two of different ways. It depends if they want to do one specific, like downtown, or mm -hmm. if they want to do multiple branches. So Dana Duffy is usually the for that she's our program coordinator and then she determines whether it's just a branch specific or it could go wider okay because for the um, author visit we're doing it in Ellettsville and at downtown and so she helped coordinate that just to make sure each branch is being met and since it is an author visit that's a little bit more high profile and it involves contracts and w-9s 
Um, but usually it goes to Dana and then she'll determine, oh, this would then be hand over to me or to Kathy. Um, and sometimes they go straight to us and it depends. Is it just, <laughs> you just wanna come down here or would it benefit everyone for all okay. the branches? Okay, great work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all your staff and all that you do for our children of our community. Okay. And next we'll get a, an update on the Southwest Branch from the branch manager, Kathy Riley. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about Southwest. Um, an interesting year. <laughs> so um, I wanted to talk about when the South Bran Southwest branch closed in January, um, we were in new territory. And I met with the Southwest staff um, on Thursday that first week, and they said, what are we going to do? And I said, we're going to make a plan. And it's going to be a lot like building a goal. We're going to talk about what are the major parts of our job. And we looked at our job description and it's customer service, programming, circulation, and we all have specialized tasks. And we talked about how can we keep these pieces that are so important to us and continue to have an impact on the community. So we built a plan out as far as we had information. And then I told them, we're gonna pivot like crazy. We're gonna start with plan A, expect a plan B, and then we're just gonna run through the alphabet all the way to Z. And I was like, and we are going to look for the moments where we can take the wins. And that's what we did. So we moved downtown, and I really wanna thank downtown for the welcome. We showed up, they made space, they made signs, they came over and said hello, and when we were at our lowest, to have that kind of welcome, we're like, we can do this. So we went to work at the service points at Ellettsville, outreach, all three of the age groups at downtown. We integrated into circulation and collection development. So we were able to get our customer service still there. We decided, okay, what programs can we still run with our community partners? Um, some of them reached out and said, we'll make space for you. Mother Hubbard's covered, um, Banneker Community Center, and that was such a feel good. They said, we heard what happened, you wanna run your program here? And we were like, yes, we do. Um, we also looked where we could assist programs already happening at our locations, and we didn't wanna duplicate. Um, and then we, looked around and we said, okay, we were sort of figuring out how we were running things at Southwest. We wanna see really close how you're running things at all the other locations and what good can we take away and like, ooh, I love that idea, let's implement it. So we cross-trained, we gathered more information and then we made our plans for when we got back here to Southwest. We were making plans like crazy. Um, and so in that transition back to Southwest, I was thinking about how the branch format lends itself to skill development and the wins. And one of the strongest ones is our multiple service points. We've got the info desk, we've got the children's desk, and we've got the teen desk. And although we have staff who specialize in each of those age groups, we rotate around all the time. You're not always gonna stay in children's, you're gonna have a teen shift, you're gonna have an information desk shift. And that affects how we view the branch and our services, because we see how services overlap and how they impact each other. And a staffer can say, hey, have you thought about doing it this way? And it's so helpful for that outside, yet a incredibly vested person who knows, I'm gonna make this suggestion, but I also know if you implement it, I'm gonna end up at that desk doing what I suggested. So that very strong, I've got understanding, but also I know I'm gonna be a part of this. The other part is circulation skills. At the branches, we're responsible for all the circulation tasks that end up the back end. And once again, we're really vested in it because we wanna make sure that holds are available, the shelves are fluffed and loved, and that is my term on how we keep the shelves and everything looking neat, and also um, that the sorter's running smoothly because our customer service at the desk depends on circulation being operational and we are circulation. How about the teaching kitchen? 
Yeah, some mad skills there. Um, because we were brainstorming, we're like, okay, how do we want to run this space? How do we run it safely? And I will tell you, as a former children's librarian, I have spent my whole career keeping people away from sharp objects and fire. And now, ta-da! <laughs> so, um, safety first. Um, so the librarians and myself, we took a CPR and first aid class. Um, we downloaded the first aid app, and we also looked into how do we want that first aid kit to be? And we went heavy on burns and cuts um, for those supplies. And then we thought about what else training do we need? Because I wouldn't say, hey, you're gonna run story time today and not give you any training. So we're looking into more training on food safety and then that will probably give us more information on what other training do we need. Um, and oh my goodness, the possibilities in the teaching kitchen. Um, the opportunity to develop partnerships, to take advantage of the resources in this county, to have conversations with people who say, hey, I'm really good at Korean cooking. And I'm like, hey, I'm gonna give you our librarian's card and we're gonna touch base and we're gonna see what kind of program we can create. Um, and the range from, let's use local produce, let's make bagels, let's do um, cook vegan. Um, and at the same time, we're saying, you know, what kind of programs do you wanna have in here? And we'll see if we can find a resource to provide that program. And it is, fascinating to see the ages. And I'm gonna talk about this in programming, but real quick on the, the other piece is we've opened up for public reservations and we are booking the space like meeting rooms. And we are getting a lot of interest and we are starting to see MCC SC use the kitchen on a weekly basis. So we're recognizing the students as they're coming in. So programming, so with us working all the programming, or all the service points, we get a variety of feedback. Um, so they're like, hey, I just saw you at the info desk and now you're hearing kids and it's like that sparks an idea of like, have you thought about offering this kind of program? So we are continuing to develop the programs we offer. Um, the goal is to offer a range, but also to build out from what we consider our core programs, um, particularly story time. Um, and our story times are incredibly popular. We have actually shifted into this room to offer story times because we're seeing anywhere from 55 to 75 people attend preschool story time. Yes, yes, yes. So we also spread out the toys in the children's room because when that many people come in to spend more time using books, the toys, um, we need to give them a lot of space as they play. Um, and we continue to have those conversations managing expectations of um, Southwest as a branch because I like to think about it as when we opened, people are like, you guys are just like downtown. I'm like, mm, we're a branch location. And what that means and how we have resources, we have a smaller collection. So we talk about programming. I'm like, we hear you. If you've got an interest in this kind of program, we're gonna try and integrate it into our the programs we can offer while still holding true to that core of providing early literacy, ongoing education, and obviously programs in our teaching kitchen. And I won't forget when we came back in and we put everything on the shelf, the children's collection didn't quite fit. Um, collection development does a fabulous job giving us the resources we ask for and what we're seeing being used. But we had to haul in some extra display shelves so we could fit our collection in. But I knew it was very temporary because I was gonna turn around and those materials were gonna head out. Board books, early readers. And I had a parent come up and say, you're early readers. I was like, yeah, and we headed over to take a look. And we were three weeks in and we had gone from fully packed where I couldn't put a book in to about a third full. And they're like, should I make a donation? Do you guys need some help with your collection? And I said, Three weeks ago, I couldn't fit another book on there. You know where these books are? They're out with the kids in the community. And they got so happy. They're like, that is awesome. But it's saying, hey, you got a question on how we're running. Let me tell you like, what's happening and how this library is being used. So tweens, teens, yeah, we got them after school, about 20 to 60 of them. So they're not just in the teen space, because one, they wouldn't fit. They're in the all ages space. They're in the children's room. They're in the study rooms. They are in the amphitheater. They are all about. And 
what we saw happening only when we came back was because we all work the different service points, we all have different reading, interests, focus, and we were seeing the teens see us at the different places, the different desks, and they would come up and talk to us about, hey, what do you recommend? And that's something we are always working on. Come up and ask me for a resource. And so they were coming to the different desks for asking for reading suggestions, and they were emboldened to see the entire library is open to them, and they are checking out materials from children's, teen, and adult shelves. And that's really what we wanna to continue to create. Um, I'm gonna end with a story, I did not see this, and I so am sad I missed this. Story time morning, usually I'm moving around. They said a preschooler came in our front doors, threw up his arms and said, story time! Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, that excitement and that feeling of being welcome is the impact we wanna to continue to create and maintain for Southwest and our community. Any questions about Southwest? I'm so sorry that you had to deal with that, but it sounds like you made the best out of a really bad situation, so congratulations. We were going after the winds like crazy. <laughs> this floor, this is floor is one of our wins because we said, hey, we're seeing a lot of use and a lot of different needs, um, like, oh, can we paint in here? Can we make crafts? And we asked Greer, was like, hey, could we switch from carpet to an easier to clean surface? And Greer was great. I was like, you make a case? And Greer's like, yes, let's talk about it. Um, the children's desk um, was really designed for one person. And we saw that we had a need to have two people from time to time. And we talked to RJE and we came back with a desk where we can fit two staff people in. Um, so we lost our children's desk. We got our replacement <laughs> and we can fit two people. We're still in the process um, on the teen desk. Um, and I'm like, okay, you had seven months to tell me um, how you're using that space. How can we work that into the function of the new one? So yeah, going after the wins. That's excellent. Any um, other? I was oh. in, I think it's the all ages room one mm -hmm. day, just like working on stuff. I needed a neutral place to work. And it was the bachelor students came yeah. in. And I mean, they really own this place. Yeah. I felt like I was like in a teenager's room. Like they, I mean, they love it. Yeah. They're comfortable. They know the place. Yeah. I almost was like, let me pack up and get out of their hair. <laughs> so I love that they love yeah. the library. Mm -hmm. Like that is so special. The one thing um, that I've asked staff to do is to greet people as they come in the front door. Um, to acknowledge like, hey, I see you. Hey, we're glad you're here. Um, which makes, I'm hoping, all the difference in them coming up to the desk and asking us for assistance. Because we've already said, I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping we will, in my career, move away from anyone who ever comes up and says, I'm sorry, I know you're busy, can I ask you a question? Um, and I say that's entirely why I'm here. Thank you. Another round of applause. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kathy. Okay, now we come to the portion of our meeting for public comment. Do we have any members of the public that would like to step forward and address the board? Seeing none, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor of adjournment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>